Most communities would say the right to live is a fundamental right. All right, but a kidney, you only need one kidney. Shouldn't people be free to buy and sell kidneys? It would save a lot of lives. If it's a matter of that person's family living, right. you know, if he doesn't sell that kidney, they may die in starvation. Right. And that's a kind of coercion. There is an enormous gap between the supply and demand of organs for transplantation. There are people who die on waiting lists every year for the want of a kidney or some other organ that they desperately need. Some have suggested that one way to ease the gap between supply and demand would be to allow a free market in kidneys, let's say, for transplantation. How many would be in favor of the free market in kidneys? And how many would be against? Let's hear first from a defender of the idea. Matthew. If allowing for a market in kidney transplants uh, allows for more kidney donations or kidney right. marketing and helping those that need the kidneys, right. I think it'd be pretty tough to be against the market. Because it would save lives. Yeah. Emily? I know there are people who need one, and I only need one, so why not sell it? Yeah. I think there are obviously restrictions on that. You know, we get into the idea of consent where there are people who may be constrained by their financial needs or by some other constraint on their ability to make a free choice. But excluding for now all of those instances, it, I don't see any issue with creating a market. All right, let's ask those who are critics of this idea, those who are uneasy about it. What, Jamie, is your reason for objecting? Uh, my problem lies with the fact that some people would receive the organs that they need over other people who have an equal need for these organs. My standpoint is not an issue regarding purchasing organs, but with the distribution on the basis of ability to pay. So you don't worry about commodifying organs as no. such? You want a fair distribution? Yes. You don't want an auction? No. Alex? In the case where there is no market, you're going to have even fewer people getting those organs. So basically, what you're suggesting says that I'd rather have five people get a random distribution of kidneys than five people get a random distribution of kidneys and five more buy them and basically get off those waiting lists. And then that's going to leave more room for other people who are regularly waiting. I, I don't understand where the problem would be. The solution to this would be a universal health care system and the government would be the purchaser of these kidneys. In that sense, it would go to the people who require them or would place the highest value on them. So if there were something like a national health insurance system, as you have in Canada, mm -hmm. if the health insurance system were the purchaser, then it would be fine. Then there's mm -hmm. nothing wrong with the selling of kidneys by those who have them. Yes. The distribution would be according to need, not means. Right. Erica? I would agree with Jamie in that I would support a market for kidneys in that it would kind of correct for the supply issue. Um, more people who needed kidneys would get them, but I don't think the solution would necessarily be a free market in which people exchange kidneys directly to people who needed them for money, but there'd be some third party who allocated kidneys in much the same way we do now with a waiting list that's based on urgency. And there's still this concern of coercion, but I think that could be corrected for through regulation. I don't right. see how a universal health care in, in which the government is a purchaser of the kidneys would solve anything because you can't stop me from selling my own kidney. I, I, it's an inherent thing I have. Everybody has one. No government regulation would restrict me from perceivably selling my own kidney. I could find a way to do it. I think that restricting something that you cannot physically restrict uh, creates a dangerous uh, precedent. Abdul? When I need a kidney so badly, my friend will donate one to me. My father would, my brother would, somebody would. If we make kidneys a good that can be sold and buy, we are crowding out uh, this idea. The idea of donation, the idea of uh, giving something for free is not important anymore. Abdul, I, I agree with you. I, I, I want ethics and moral thing, but I, I think it's extremely difficult to legislate morality onto people. It's just... Uh, where, you know. where would we draw the line about marketization? Now it's kidneys. Tomorrow, will I be able to sell one of my eyes? But where do the week after, will I be able to sell one of my hands? I don't know, like, where will we stop? Kevin? I asked the question of in a background of a somewhat unequal system, can somebody make a free choice to give away their kidney? If you look somebody in the face who is a single parent of a number of kids and their kids go to a terrible school, 
right? But you give them $10,000 for a kidney and that's enough for them to move in a different neighborhood and get more education, Is can they make a fully free choice? Well, that's only the same as making a choice when you're looking your son in the eye who's dying because he's got kidney failure. That's only the same choice that we're yeah. talking about with I would charity. agree with Maybe. Ellie in that the concerns that you're bringing up also apply to kidney donations. Yeah. That, that's most certainly true. So I, is there a, a difference? I believe that, I think that a third party which, for example, set a universal price, like for example, today you can go to the Philippines and buy a kidney for $300. That's ridiculous because in the U.S. somebody will pay ten thousand dollars for a kidney. Where does that money go to? Middlemen. A third party, which actually set a universal price across different countries, might make it more moral. Plus, might be able to lessen the possibility of exploitation and coercion. And by exploitation and coercion, if there is a, let's say, a struggling peasant, desperately poor, in the developing world, he or she might be willing to sell a kidney for much less than someone in a developed country. But that's true with a lot of goods and services, that they're produced at a lower cost in developing countries or poor societies. Why, Kevin, do you think that that person, let's say a, an Indian peasant in the countryside who's desperately poor, and this may be the, her only chance to send her kids to get an education, why shouldn't she have that choice to decide for herself what value to place on her kidney? because she might not know what the actual prevailing value in areas which desire kidneys actually are. Nicole? You'd have to be in a pretty desperate situation to think about selling your organs in the first place. Right now, thousands of people die every year because they can't get a kidney. Uh, and donating a kidney is, is, is not particularly risky for the person donating it. And the system we have now, which is looking for voluntary transactions, is, sort of, is, not, is not working. People are not donating enough kidneys to save everybody who needs one. So I have no problem with people developing a market for kidneys. We have so much inequality in our society. I think people would feel differently if everybody had the same income. Now you say, okay, everybody's the same income. I'm exposing myself to a greater risk. Should the individual who is willing to accept that risk be compensated for exposing himself to that greater risk in return for giving somebody else the right to live? And you would say, maybe so, if the background conditions of the society are more or less equal. That's right. And the reason that matters is that you think against background conditions of inequality, there's coercion really operating. It's not a truly voluntary. It's not a truly voluntary. If, if, if it's a matter of that person's family living, right. you know, if he doesn't sell that kidney, they may die in starvation. Right. And that's a kind of coercion. I wouldn't call it coercion. What I'd call it is it limits your choices. Um, it may also limit your choices in ways that makes it harder to make rational choices for some people. But I'm, that I'm not even completely sure of. I think poor people can be rational people um, as well. And by rational choice, you mean? Acting their own interest. Um, doing what's, what's best for them given the circumstances they have. You should worry about poverty, income inequality directly and not say, gosh, because we're worried about poverty, we're not going to let this poor person sell his kidney and we'll let this person who needs a kidney die because it doesn't help the poor person. He's still poor. Doesn't, certainly doesn't help the person who needs the kidney. He just, he's, he's, he's dead. That seems like a, a very strange response to me to, um, to dealing with uh, income inequality. Just because there's a voluntary transaction doesn't mean it's in the interest of society. Whether any particular set of transactions goes to the sense of what is it that defines the community, what are their values. Hmm. I think most communities would say the right to live is a fundamental right. And I think that that constitutes a kind of choice that th that person is selling like a literal part of their body because that's all that they can do to survive. And right. I think that there is something unsavory about that. Unsavory, um, coercive, yeah, exploitative. Yeah. It's, yeah, but on the other hand, you want people to be able to s subsist in any way that they can. So, so where do you come down? I, I think you shouldn't have to sell it. You know, but that's an argument for kind of raising everybody's standards of living enough that nobody would want to sell their kidney or need to sell their kidney in general. Do you think that anyone who general. sells a kidney out of economic necessity is not really acting freely? Yeah, I think probably. I'm sensitive not, to that as well. They're not really acting freely. Yeah. Does everybody agree with that, or does some disagree with that? I, I disagree. We see people selling their health for cash in tons of industries. I mean, a coal mine, I understand that. If I go in there, I'm gonna receive high wages. 
in return for sacrificing my health. The National Football League, I mean, I'm gonna die likely 20 years younger because I'm playing professional football and my head's getting bashed around. But with understanding of that, I'm willing to sell my health. I think that's a very similar dilemma to giving a kidney, whereas I'm basically just willing to receive payment to give up some of my health. Do you think in those analogous cases, it's morally unobjectionable for people to sell, as you put it, sell their health? I do think it's unobjectionable. And why should we be able to sell our health? I think I'm entitled to how I take care of my own body. And I think if I have an awareness that I will improve my welfare by selling my health because some other aspect of my life requires funds. For example, if I can't afford food but selling this will allow me to eat, then uh, I think there are plenty of examples where I'm entitled to sell right, it. Let me play out the logic of this, James. Please. Let's suppose I'm a poor peasant in the developing world. What will most improve my welfare will be to send my two children to get an education, which I can't afford to provide for the first. Then a few years later, my second child needs to go to school, and the same broker comes around, or maybe I call him, and I say, I'll sell you my second kidney. In other words, committing suicide. But it's my body, my health, my sense of what's important. Should I have a right to do that? No. I think when it comes to directly ending your life, or uh, even if not directly, but indirectly ending your life, and it's next to certain, then no, I don't think you should have the right to sell uh, your death. But selling my health is okay. Yes. Erica? This is kind of like a one-to-one -one trade off in lives, whereas with the kidney example, um, we're saving two lives. That's right, thinking of the recipients, never mind the kids who get an education. So what conclusion do you draw from that? Well, I would say that uh, in terms of like number of lives saved, these seem like equivalent scenarios. And so I do think there's room for the kind of arguments about whether we have a right to end our own lives. Well, because one life is lost, two lives are saved, and two kids get an education. So what do you say, Erica? So I'd come back to this question of um, freedom of choice. It seems suspect that someone would freely and with full information give up their own life. But if it were possible to do so, I wouldn't have a problem. You would, would not have a problem. And you think ethically, if the utilitarian calculus, which you've been emphasizing, works out this <laughs> way, which it very well might in this case, you would support that. So it seems like practically unlikely um, because of Why? these concerns about consent. But if you, what you're concerned with is utility. Why worry about the consent? Lives saved, education for these two kids. So why does consent override utility in this case? I'm not sure. I don't have you an can call a friend you. if you want. <laughs> Lindsay? Oh, I, I was going to disagree with the principle because I don't believe that um, losses to some can be made up by gains to others, especially if there's a life involved here. And in practice, I would disagree with it as well because I feel like there would have to be a really high degree of coercion involved here because he can't afford to send his two kids to school and thus his judgment is clouded by these concerns and concerns well, wait for a minute. His... Why do you say clouded? Why not say informed by the concern and the commitment for his kids' education? Because I don't believe that he would make the same decision with different financial means. Yeah. And this is a decision that is detrimental to him, so I would argue clouded. And let me put it to you, Alex. Suppose the person who wants to buy my kidney is not someone who needs an organ transplant, but is an eccentric art collector who wants to shellac my kidney and put it on his coffee table as a conversation piece. <laughs> but he's willing to make it worth my while. He's willing to pay maybe even more than the market rate, than the going rate. What's the moral status of that? Deal. Should I have the right to sell him? Is, is there anything wrong with that? I don't think that there is any ground for more objection to it. It's you're willing to sell your kidney, the, the other person is willing to buy it. The market matches both of you. The market brings us together, we make a exactly. voluntary deal. Yes, you're happy that you got the money, the other person is happy that they got the kidney. And at the same time, no rights are violated. Your inalienable right to life is there, and you also have your right to consent. And you have agreed to this, so I completely don't see a problem with a transaction happening. Go ahead. If we were concerned about coercion in a situation where somebody was 
selling a kidney in order to sell it to somebody who needed it for health purposes, then I think we should be even more concerned about like, like what kind of desperation would you have to be in to sell your kidney for somebody who's just gonna like put it on their mantelpiece? But you don't even have to know that. All you have well, to know is that they're gonna offer you uh, maybe it's even so well, much as like fifteen thousand like dollars. It's the same thing when you donate blood. Like like the the Red Cross has gotten criticism for not telling donors that they are going to then sell the blood to other people. You mm. know, because if you go in thinking that it's one thing and it's not actually that thing, then there are some problems with well, that. Well, that would be an element of deception. Yeah, yeah. But it reminds me, we haven't really addressed a point Abdul made earlier that if we allow the buying and selling of organs, then fewer and fewer people will be motivated to donate organs out of altruism. What do you think, Emily? Um, I'm hesitant to, to think that's a, that would actually be the case. Just because there's a market for something where people will buy and sell an organ, the people most likely to buy organs from people who are selling them are those who wouldn't have people willing to donate organs to them. People who are on a list because they don't have um, relatives with close genetic matches or somebody within their, I guess. I think those who are going to buy those kidneys who have the money for it and do not want their brother or their sister or their cousin to sacrifice their kidney for them. So they say, you know what, you keep your kidney for you and I'm going to buy a, buy, you know, buy a one from a poor person down the street from the kidneys bank. Yes, if we make selling kidneys as a commodity, that may increase the supply, which is a fact that we should all be embarrassed of because that says a lot about the equality of our people and about how much money people are making and how much they're willing to sacrifice for money. But also it will drop the number of people who are willing to donate the kidneys for free, for altruistic reasons. Donated kidneys will become something like money, you know, not like something moral, not something altruistic. Right. So I would like to ask the people who seem to bring up the moral argument that, you know, there's this art collector, but then there might be the person who needs the kidney for a health reason. I want to ask, do you think that in that role, there's a role for the state to say, no, you can't sell the, your kidney to that art collector. You have to sell it to this person who needs it. All right, let Jamie address it. It's fine to uh, have a market where people can sell their own kidneys, but they must be distributed to those who have the highest and, need for and, them. And, 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 and the highest need for them uh, would be determined medically. And my counterclaim would be that, again, we go back to the issue of, there will always be someone who will be willing to service that need, quote unquote, of that art collector and be willing to accept an exorbitant amount of money. You're inevitably the black going, market you're, will there's be going to There's inevitably going to be a black market. Maybe. And then All we right, have, what about the yeah. crowding out effect? Who has a reply to that? Ellie? I still am not convinced that by offering a kidney for sale, you will crowd out those people who will give one for free. I think that sometimes with our connections within family units or so on and so forth are so strong that they actually trump the purchase that you could get I, from. I'll tell you what, it's like my mom. Uh, she could drive me to school, but in a stage she would pay a bus to, you know, take me to school. And that kind of crowded out this value of having my mom taking care of me and driving me to school and, you know, giving me a kiss before she drops me. Now she will pay for a taxi or for a bus to come and take me. That crowded out this value. These moral stuff that we really like and enjoy our life will not exist if we make everything up to sale. Anecdotes aside, altruism is not currently meeting the demand for kidneys. Even if we are crowding out altruistic donations, if selling kidneys were able to increase the supply of kidneys available to people who need them to save their lives, then it would still be worthwhile. I'm, I'm not sure about that. I'm not sure about that because if somebody really, really needs a kidney, finding somebody who would be willing to donate your kidney for you, like a friend or a family member, is, is possible, so I guess. And I may be wrong. Wait, so you'd rather have like hundreds of people die just because you don't want to have a certain practice become no, archivized? I'm not, I'm, I do not have a clear stand on this. I'm just proposing a concern that if we decide to, to make this community up, up to sale, this is a concern we have to think about. I would like to hear about you. What do you think about this? I'm not convinced at all that making the practice uh, paid will necessarily crowd out all the people who donate for altruistic reasons just all because... All the people. Well, that's make it, putting it a little strongly. I'm sure that it's going to have some effect, but I'm mm. pretty sure that I, I do believe that this effect will be offset by the, the more mm. people that will join those who are selling their kidneys and more people in the end will receive like donations and more people are going to live for longer, which is, I think this is to the benefit of society in the end. And it's also a question about like, how do people place value in different things? If for this person, the kidney is equally valuable to education, then he has the right to choose and do so. Explicitly, of course he wants to sell the kidney. It's a free transaction. I want to sell my kids to college. Sounds funny. 
But implicitly, deep down at heart, if he could not sell the kidney, he wouldn't do it. And I'm telling you now, you believe in profit maximization. I would pay you a million dollars for your kidney. Would you sell it just, you know, for the point of million I dollars? might. I, I don't know. Well, I actually might. People do make trade-offs in life. And if someone is willing to trade their kidney for education, I would not do it, but I don't necessarily have a problem with it because people value, the, like, they do value different things differently. What like, I'm trying to establish is we do not wake up in the morning saying, oh, I think my kidney is worth sending my son to college, therefore I will sell it. What I'm saying is life puts us in a very, very hard circumstances that tells us I have to do this. There is no other option. I'm yeah, I agree with that. The person who asked the man to sell his kidney came to him and didn't say, come work for me and do this job and you'll be able to send your kids to college. He didn't give him that option. This man feels like he has no other option other than to sell his kidney. Some economists argue that these moral sentiments, these generous virtues are in fixed supply. Hmm. They're scarce. I don't think there's any evidence that altruism is in fixed supply. I don't think there's a trade-off between income and altruism. I mean, one of the things when I worked in international development that always struck me was that the people who contribute to charity the most are, are people with lower incomes um, because they, they have a deeper appreciation and understanding of what deprivation and poverty mean. So using sort of pure market logic to understand altruism is, uh, is I think, a bit misguided. Why do you say you don't believe altruism is in fixed supply? You know, all societies have ways to deal with social problems and social dilemmas. And it usually falls between four institutions, the family, the community, the state, and the market. And somehow thinking that there's a fixed amount of altruism and you've got to put shove as much of responsibility into the market as you can, goes really flies in the face of human experience and human history. Most people operate in a much more complicated place than that, and there's a huge amount of altruism that makes families and communities work. And there's a huge amount of altruism embedded in the redistributive functions of the state, uh, in the fact that people recognize that there are common goods and public goods, and we need the state to deliver those. So I, I don't think altruism is in fixed supply. I think altruism is all over the place. We've been wrestling with the idea of consent. What counts as genuine consent? What is a truly voluntary exchange? Even where there may not be a gun to someone's head, many would say a choice made under conditions of desperate poverty, let's say, is not truly free. So this is one big question that we need to resolve any time we're trying to decide whether to use markets or not. How voluntary is the exchange? How free is the choice? How true is the consent? Or is it beclouded and pressured by economic necessity or by lack of information? So that issue is clear. But there is another kind of question, another kind of ethical question that arises when we try to figure out whether there's anything wrong with commodifying the human body or our body parts that may not have to do with tainted consent. Take the example of prostitution. One of the main arguments people make when they oppose prostitution is it's not truly voluntary in many cases because the people who are going to prostitution are pressured by poverty or drug addiction or the threat of violence and so on. That's a familiar consent argument. But let's take the case of a prostitute who's not desperately poor, but who chooses the work freely. Is there any further moral objection to selling sex or selling one's body for sex, Ellie? The concern here would be that the commodification of sex would somehow corrupt the, the value of sex. Wait, spell that out a little bit. What does it mean that commodifying sex corrupts the meaning of sex? It would be something that was very special, it would be something that was undertaken by two people who were very much in love, and one could argue that if you uh, put a price on sex, you somehow cheapen it. But at the same time, I think people have enough agency to understand the difference between prostitution and sex in that form, and sex in the sense of two people who are married and living their lives together. Ryan? Again, and I, I've mentioned before, we can't legislate morality, we can't move towards a moral end goal that I think is impossible to achieve. But wait, 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 wait. You've yeah. said this a few times. 
we can't legislate morality. Yeah. Do you mean as a practical matter, it's hard to enforce? Yes. That's or do what you I mean. mean that ethically speaking, or from the standpoint of justice, it's wrong to even try to legislate Yes, morality. I agree. We, we can't, we, which? We, the latter. We cannot expect everybody to have the same moral end goals. We cannot prevent prostitution because of that. Uh, it will inevitably happen. Now you're sliding back into the sure. enforcement problem. Sure, okay. I want to know whether you have a principled objection to what okay. some call paternalist legislation. I do, yes. And what is that objection? There's the view that everybody has to adopt the same set of moral, morals, and that there has to be a set of morals that has to be legislated across uh, a cross-section of society, and I, I think that's unrealistic. I disagree with that on every front. I agree with you completely, uh, based on this idea of liberal neutrality in which laws should not adhere to any one moral standard and force one moral standard upon society. In this particular circumstance, given that there is full consent, I don't believe that the state has the authority to impose its moral view on consenting adults. Jamie? That's what laws are. Laws are the minimum moral standard that are shared and imposed on society. There are people who would accept physical abuse, yet we impose on them that in our society, we hold that below our lowest moral standards, which we call the legal system. But those are, those are, those are issues which affect someone else's rights. Uh, prostitution, that's not interfering with anybody's rights. That's a consensual transaction. With something like abuse, that is not consensual. All right, there are two issues here. One of them is the question of whether, tainted consent aside, there is something morally objectionable to prostitution, to selling sex for money. And Ellie has suggested, yes, maybe there is, that selling sex corrupts its meaning, its higher meaning. And then there's the second question, which is what the law should be whether that moral concern about corrupting or degrading human sexuality should be embodied in law, and that's where Lindsay and Jamie were disagreeing about whether the law should embody morality. Go ahead, Matt. I'd like to respond to the corruption argument. Yeah. I feel like it assumes a single view of what sex means in a pluralistic society. For some people, they'll agree with you it should be between two people in a Binding relationship, but for others it's a casual thing. They should be able to commodify it. If, for example, I'm someone in a relationship and I can have sex with either a prostitute or my girlfriend, and the prostitute would offer sex for like $500 or something, and I have sex with my girlfriend, I'm not thinking in the back of my mind, I'm getting $500 worth of sex right now. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't think there's that corruptive. No, which is why I said I think that individuals have enough agency to differentiate between those two types of sex. We might not be able to necessarily agree on what sex is, ideally, but perhaps there might be another thing of treating a person as an object. I would argue that a lot of people who pay for sex through prostitutes are not necessarily looking for sex, but actually looking for the act of having power over another person by purchasing something from them, treating them as an object rather than another human being. That might be another possible objection, an issue of objectification. I think whether or not you, you engage in prostitution doesn't really affect how, the way you view sex. If you objectify women, whether or not you hire a prostitute doesn't really affect your, your view on, on women. I agree with Jamie. Law is morality in some sense. Like you are legislating like what is proper for people to do, what should be illicit. And when you're thinking about like, okay, if prostitution should be legal, what are the kinds of things that we have to think about so <coughs> nobody gets hurt and everybody is giving consent. But it's all about like what the society decides is valued, which is really hard to come to. But you're not opposed in principle to embodying moral judgments in law. That's that's what law is. Yeah. It is regulating behavior, and there are, and there is implicit judgment in, in that. It, you can't avoid implicit it. Implicit moral. Yeah. You're yeah. saying that morality is in laws, and I'm saying that they should be neutral. If prostitution is legal, the law is implicitly saying that this is an okay thing but to do. I, I think it's, it's saying that it's saying morally that permissible. It's morally <laughs> permissible. It's not a. I, I think we disagree on the purpose of laws. I, I think the purpose of laws is keeping individual rights. I don't agree so much that there's a moral component to it. And How is there not? Rather like than protecting liberty and the rights of a Yeah, because you believe that protecting liberty person. is a moral I, good, so you are we're, saying we're that that's into permissible. Issues, I mean, yeah. Yeah. Like, wait, 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 wait. I think prostitution should be legal because of the fact that it's moral on liberty grounds and not on moral judgment grounds, which many people differ on. I want to test that issue by considering another kind of job that's legally and morally controversial. Have you heard of dwarf tossing? Have you heard of it? No. Yeah. no. Yes. 
All right, who can describe it? Who's read, read up on uh, it? Somebody buys the right to throw a little person. Right, it's a game in pubs or right. bars where people of small stature, as they're called, <laughs> put on protective gear and helmets and consent for pay to be thrown across the room into padded wall or something as a pub game, a kind of sport. And there have been debates in various countries, actually, debates in France, debates in, in Europe and in various American states about whether this should be banned. How many would vote to ban it? And how many would not? Everyone else would be opposed to banning it. All right, let's first hear from the majority. On what grounds would you, would you permit this, Emily? To me, it seems like there's absolutely no you know, pressure that forces somebody to put on you know, foam pads and get tossed across the room. Football players are paid to do essentially what uh, these people do, which is put their, you know, put on pads and get tossed around by people. Now there is one difference with professional football. It is true that professional football players get banged up pretty severely, but no one is actually used as the ball. That's true. Does that make a difference? It seems like it should make a difference, but I find mm. myself trying to yeah. find a way where it wouldn't. Matthew? I imagine the objection would be that it's humiliating in a way. Oh. But I imagine that would also be considered in the wage rates of these small people, in the same way coal miners are compensated for the risks that they incur. So I don't see the dif what the qualifying difference is. Is compensation for risks right. the same as compensation for humiliation? I don't see the qualifying difference between the two. Mm -hmm. Kevin? I would argue that in a liberal democratic society, it's somewhat dependent upon viewing other humans as worthy of respect, equality, mm -hmm. and equal rights. And to view somebody as an object, a ball to be taken in a sport, is antithetical to that value upon which we all agree. What is the value? The value of viewing other human beings as individual, actionable agents with rights. Dignity? And dignity. And is this really all that different from hiring somebody so that you could beat them? Ellie. I think this is the trouble, this is the objectification, and I think that's where Matthew was right when we were talking about prostitution. The difference here is the fact that, that these smaller people are smaller. That's the quality that they have that, that makes them eligible for such a practice. Like Kevin was saying, when you're basing your preferences on a different quality that somebody has, I think that, that can then be quite problematic. Does that mean that in deciding what practices should be commodified, bought and sold on the market. We need to inspect and morally evaluate the consumer preferences that are reflected in the market choices? I would tend to think no. I would tend to think that preferences are exogenous, they're prior to the voluntary exchange. But I think that in the case of children, certainly, there is a consideration there. But in this case, these are but not children. But in this case, is they, these are not children. And I think it boils down to that, that socially accepted norm that we are all equal and worthy of respect. And I think that the sale of sex in terms of prostitution is not particularly derogatory, but I think in this circumstance um, it is. And so we do have to lean more towards some kind of substantive notion of morality that's placed in law. And you would embody this substantive notion of morality in a law preventing this practice. I, I think I would have to, yeah. I agree that we want to establish the principle that we respect everyone in terms of individual rights, in terms of dignity, in terms of equality, but I think that the way that we do that is respecting the autonomy of individuals to make decisions regarding their behavior. And if it's not going to injure anybody, then I, I don't see a problem with, I don't see a problem with this. So what it means to respect their dignity is precisely to let them decide for themselves whether to be thrown across the room for Exactly. Pay. Of course, I see the importance of respecting human rights, human dignity, and human equality. But I think that leads to the exact opposite result. Do you think that part of what it is to possess dignity and to have one's dignity respected includes the right to sell off or sell out one's dignity, to humiliate oneself, if that's what's happening? I think that it is the right of the individual to make choices regarding their behavior. If the state respects that, then they're respecting the dignity of the person. And that's why you think that government and law should be neutral with respect to substantive moral judgments? Yes, sir, I do. The objection is? A loss of dignity. Some would say, but shouldn't it be up to the person himself or herself whether to engage in that deal? Uh, 
I think this goes to the fundamentals of the nature of our society. What do we mean by the dignity of the individual? I think those are things which most of us, I think, would find offensive and undermine the solidarity of our society. The government is a very powerful institution. You're basically, it's, it's the one thing in society that has a monopoly over force. And using that thing to impose my values on other people is something I'm reluctant to do. But in the case of the dwarf tossing, no one is being forced, neither the patron in the pub who wants to pay to throw the person, nor the person who submits to it. Yes, but I view, I view, I view it as degrading, actually, for both people in the, in the transaction. Even though the participants are willing, consenting adults, what, what, what does it mean to say that it's degrading? This is not treating them politely as human beings. Now, maybe they could convince me this is all done and fun and it's fine. In a different world, if, if I said we're going to get you know, really big guys crashing into each other on a regular basis, such that their bodies are constantly breaking and having injuries, I'd say that seems kind of a horrible thing, but we, you know, football's quite a popular sport. Uh, we have all sorts of things that in the abstract look kind of degrading, but people view it as heroic. But some values should be priceless. One of those values are dignity. To be able to buy somebody else's dignity, we are telling them that this value is not value. Because simply you are giving the person who has the money, the authority and the power to own other people's basic rights. And again, you said they are autonomous, they are free to make these decisions. To what extent somebody is really free to be thrown across the room? How, Who how enjoys that? They're making their I, own decision. Who I, are you to say like, that? I, 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 I'm not I, sure I, about like unemployment numbers yeah. for that population, but what if that's the only thing that they can do? I feel like you're making a practical making a concern no, about but a, a, it, a moral but principle, but which you I do, think is irrelevant. But you need to take into account like what kind of consent can they actually give, which is something that we were talking about earlier. And also, like you mentioned, we shouldn't legislate like just what's distasteful. People are doing this because they see somebody who is of smaller statue, they think, hey, wouldn't it be funny if I threw them across the room? To me, that's not distasteful. That is completely devaluing that yeah. person but as an individual, no. as a human no. being. But what if that person derives pleasure yes. from that? What if that person likes to be thrown around? Find well, this me question. That Do they really though? Like to I'll tell you what, I am fine, I am fine with being a slave. Can I sell my, my right for, of liberty? Slavery is something completely no, I, different. Well, actually, no, you right. said I am completely free to sell my dignity. I am completely free to do whatever. I, I it's a free see, America. I your, Can I sell my freedom in a free America? No, because there, there are inalienable rights and you cannot give your, give your freedom away. But you're saying that dignity is not one of those inalienable rights and he's disagreeing I say that your definition you. of dignity is very different than and, what... And it's taking away someone's right to choose what they want to do with themselves yes. is essentially taking away Thank their you. dignity by... There isn't a problem with supplying yourself as a little person to be thrown people have enough agency to be able to choose whether that is acceptable. My concern arises when we get into the demand that's for true. such What is it that a, troubles a, a, you about the demand, the consumer preference yeah. that lies uh, behind this market? Yeah. yeah, I think there is a problem with the notion that we would be able to simultaneously respect somebody while purchasing them to throw them across the room. Do you think there are certain consumer preferences that are unworthy of being fulfilled. The dignity of the individual, even though they consent to it, I think that actually trumps the preference of a person to purchase them, to throw them. What about the moral status of the preferences and desires that markets cater to and aggregate? Should we judge them, morally speaking? Or should we try as best we can to desist from passing judgment on the preferences people bring to markets? The argument for extending markets seems to rest not only on a certain idea of freedom, but also on the idea that markets spare us the need to pass judgment on the preferences people have. And there's something appealing about this refusal to judge. And yet, part of what this discussion has shown is we may not always be able to step back from judging preferences, and maybe there are cases when we should judge the quality of preferences, the moral character of the preferences people bring to market relations, maybe some of those preferences may actually violate human dignity. Maybe this is what we mean when we say that certain aspects of the human person or of human dignity are priceless, something money shouldn't buy.